and welcome to the second annual International Investment Leadership Summit for 2022. We're delighted to bring you some of the biggest names in international financial services at this year's summit, which comes live and direct from our TV studios here in Covent Garden, London. With me today are David Nishaw, CEO from IFGL. Welcome, David. Andy Finch, CEO from Canaccord Genuity Wealth Management. Welcome. We have Riyad Adamau, CCO, Chief Commercial Officer from Holborn Assets. Welcome, Riyad. Ariel Amigo, who's the Chief Marketing and Distribution Officer at Investors Trust. Welcome, Ari. Thank you. And Ari, by the way, has, has come the furthest, so thank you for coming all the way from Miami. Yeah. Fantastic. And we're very grateful for people to come from Guernsey and the Isle of Man. I mean, Riyadh, you're from Dubai. Right. And we have Maurice Keane, Managing Partner from Evelyn Partners. Welcome, Maurice. Thank you. And where did you come in from today? About 20 minutes away, going. <laughs> Fantastic. Wonderful to see everybody. Now, today the theme is leadership, and it's been, you know, perhaps today looking at the recent leadership changes, maybe over the last three, four years with the current UK government, it shows how important leadership can be. As we sit around the table today and have this conversation, we can take the opportunity to find out from the international financial services leaders that we have how strong, effective leadership can produce the right results. So I'm going to jump onto the first question, which is, what are the biggest challenges for cross-border advice and wealth management industry 2022 and beyond? I'll start with David because I'm looking directly at you. Thank you, Gary. I think there's one word that hits me quite often in this, it is uncertainty. And that uncertainty, uncertainty uh, applies in many different ways. Uncertainty in regulation. I mean, we accept regulation, and by and large, it's a good thing or certainly well intentioned. Um, so, I need, or we need, I think, regulatory certainty, so understanding and clear direction of travel so we can prepare. Certainty over the stock markets. Uh, we can survive the stock markets, but I think it's very tricky for advisors in particular. If there's volatility and uncertainty in the stock markets, it makes them makes it more difficult to know what to say to clients about how to invest, and that therefore impacts on us. And I think some of the recent uh, events like COVID and others have given us uncertainty over, uh, which is perhaps a new one I wouldn't have said last year, recruitment. We're finding it increasingly difficult to get skilled people in all the really sensitive areas across the business in many countries. And that's really hit us over the last few months uh, in particular. I'll move to the other end of the, the table, if I may, to, to Andy. What's your take on that, Andy? Um, so I share some of David's thoughts for that. I think for us, so we find ourselves in what is probably the most challenging macroeconomic conditions almost for a generation, <coughs> I suggest, and clients are going to find that challenging. Advisors also, quite frankly, we find it quite challenging in this type of environment. So if we're going to earn the loyalty and we're going to encourage prospects and clients to stay the course, we just need to make sure that we remain focused on delivering our promises to them in that open, transparent manner. And I think the loyalty with the confidence of clients is one of our biggest challenges right now. It's, it's really difficult because when things are, are outside of the control, I think as effective leaders, people like to have that control. Moving over to you, Riyadh, I mean, when it comes to, you're at the, the core face of our industry, you know, you're uh, one of the leaders within Holborn Assets um, who are seeing the clients. How, how is this uncertainty affecting the, the clients? Well, obviously it's difficult, but you can only focus on really what you can control. Um, and I think it's really the pace of change that is, is causing a great difficulty. Um, I mean, when you look at what's happened, like we say, we've just been through a pandemic, we've got the, the new macroeconomic climate, which is obviously difficult. Um, so it's forcing change at a much faster pace than most can keep up with. And obviously that has a, a knock-on effect to things like margins. So it really does question the business model and the, the viability of the company as an ongoing concern. So it's, it's very challenging on a number of different fronts. Um, so you can just focus on what you can control, really, and that's about all you can do. Maurice, is, is this period of uncertainty the biggest challenge that the industry is, is facing, or are there other challenges that, that you're seeing within the industry? Yeah, I think uncertainty clearly is, is the biggest challenge, and it's the length of time this uncertain period has continued. So you've had COVID, 
we've now got geopolitical situations with the Russian um, invasion of Ukraine and the effect that's had on markets. Um, but you add into that the industry already had margin compression, which I think you've we had alluded to. So you put those together, it's difficult. And I think the solution to this is just to remain focused on your core proposition. So you've got, from an asset management point of view, you've got client uncertainty, market uncertainty, and an element of regulatory uncertainty with the sanction regime that's just come in. So it is difficult. It's um, difficult to navigate, but I think the key thing is stay focused on your proposition, which we will do with our partners because clearly we're intermediary-led. Good, good answer. So, Ari, when, when we're looking at, at the challenges, we've, we've, we've spoken in the past about you know, regulation, we've spoken in the past about the consolidation of the industry, which we might touch on later. What, is there anything additional to what, what's been mentioned that you see as a, a challenge? No, no, not additionally. <clears throat> I would think that you know, if you think about the next 12 months, I think market turbulence is, is the biggest uh, challenge. Um, a lot of end clients are looking for answers. Um, IFAs need to provide those answers. They're very busy, so you need to um, really focus on hand-holding and, and, and providing help uh, for those asset for those answers. Go back to um, you know long-term uh, investment objectives that you discuss with the client. Uh, try to uh, calm down uh, everyone until you know the, that turbulence goes away. Is it not one of the answers? Is that during these turbulent times there's there's an opportunity to make money. I mean, you just look at the UK, the pounds, you know, in the toilet, and guess what? <coughs> a bunch of hedge fund managers have just made billions, you know. Um, so maybe uncertainty is a, a good thing for the industry. I mean, I'll come back to you, David, just staying with this point. You're, you know, how do you plan for something like this? You, I know you're a person that likes five year plans, and surely you didn't expect COVID, Queen dying, three or four prime ministers in three years or whatever. How do you plan for stuff like that and what do you do in the contingency? Well, two things. One, <coughs> yes, we like uh, five-year plans, but the first it's the first year that's the really detailed one. Then it gets more generic when you get five years out, so you adapt. So pl plans don't have to be fixed. So the answer is the plans that we're writing now for next year are not exactly the same as the ones we forecast last year. So you adapt. And also, although there's turmoil, remember, we're at heart a platform in an insurance wrapper so we uh, and you could say that makes life easier for us we don't take the investment decisions we're open architecture platform and the advisors and their clients have to take those decisions so at one level we're sort of agnostic at that level the, cl the advisors will choose the funds according to what they think is appropriate and we're sort of agnostic we as long as we've got the right products available for the advisors and clients to choose um, then I don't mind. I mean, it sounds a bit flippant. I don't mean it to be, but that our job is to provide a stable and well governance platform, uh, not to worry too much about whether you know Asia is performing better than South America, for example, as a fund. Now I mentioned global regulation. How has global regulation gone too far or not far enough? Is the the crux of this question? But how does the industry? I mean, this is something that's always fascinated me. How, especially with everyone around the table doing business in lots of different jurisdictions. How do you balance that when there's different rules in different countries? How do you get around that? I'll come to you, Ari. I mean, you've got, um, you've got headquarters in, in different jurisdictions as well. How do you balance that? Um, I think you need to get the right talent. Um, you need to hire the, the right people in each one of the jurisdictions, make sure they're up to date, make sure that they're following with, uh, from a compliance standpoint with every single guideline. Uh, rule and regulation and then in the in those cases where perhaps things are getting really too complicated you need to go outside of your firm and look for counsel uh, you know, that's that's the way to to tackle this this challenging situations in in many jurisdictions at the same time in, in some occasions Andy what's your your take on this yeah, so um, to answer the question is uh, has the global regulation gone too far? I think the answer is no, <coughs> as far as we're concerned. Um, it's, it's not necessarily about taking it further, though. It's more about harmonising the regulatory environment. And we, we have operations in a number of different jurisdictions around the world. And the complexity that comes with having to deal with a different set of rule books, uh, that complexity breeds cost in our business. Cost filters uh, one way, typically as far as the customer's concerned. But in a fee compression environment, that becomes 
uh, ever more challenging. Uh, and I think what we should aspire to is that good set of standards. And actually, historically, we'd have seen product providers, advisors, perhaps playing a game of regulatory arbitrage. If we can remove that, then I think that would be a good thing. Yeah, that's a good point. I'll come to you, Riyadh. Um, speaking on, on, you know, speaking about regulation, do you think there's scope for potentially like a, a single global regulator? Are we at that stage yet, or do you think it's necessary to keep those geographical constraints? I don't think that's possible. I think, you know, we're in 20 odd countries, and you go to each of those countries, they've got their own vision, they've got their own uh, thoughts of how they want their financial sector to look, and they're all at different stages today, and they're all going to be at different stages in three or five years. So I don't think one single regulator, although that would be very nice and it would give a lot of clarity, uh, is possible. Um, so, look, it, it is difficult. Regulation is, is changing, and it's changing quickly. And like I say, most of us are kind of struggling to keep up because of whether it's direct or indirect regulation, it can, it can really still have an impact. But I think it's just about having regulation in the right areas. So you want regulation to improve the competitive landscape. You want it to basically improve better outcomes for clients. And we have seen regulation from a number of different areas over the last couple of years, Middle East in particular, uh, we've seen it in the UK with uh, trustees and so on and so forth. Um, and it does make things difficult and I don't necessarily think that regulation hit the mark. And there's a lot we can do in the international space to, to really drastically improve the proposition. But thus far it's not quite come in, it's not quite hit the mark, so we're, we're hopeful. David, you know, the the thought that I'm having is because this is a cross-border industry that we operate in, surely there must be some cross-border guidelines that, that could be, you know, that could be implemented. <coughs> Has this been spoken about before? Or is this something? Or is it? Um, well, the way us as an Alaman insurer are affected is that we have our own conduct of business rules which govern all the Alaman insurance companies, which in effect are cross-border because they say wherever you get your business you have to work within minimum criteria and then you overlay that with individual rules in local countries whether that be the UAE or anywhere else Hong Kong uh, so we as a manufacturer on the Alaman almost do have a sort of prototype one because they say wherever you accept your business the advisor must be regulated it should be retail funds only and you know a, a whole litany of other rules uh, so we think we have been working within that, within broad, in broad way, uh, since, uh, since they came in in 19. Now, a lot of people talk about the, you know, the UK model as being the, the one to follow. I mean, I'm, I'm old enough to remember um, when fact finds came in for the first time, I just started out in the industry as a financial advisor, you know, and it was like the, there was a pushback against fact finding at the time. But the UK models, you know, you, you operate in the UK and internationally. Do you think that it is still the UK model that's the, you know, the higher echelon or is there another model that's out there that's getting, you know, that, that we should follow? Yeah, I think that's an interesting point. Sitting in the UK, you're always going to say the UK model's the highest echelon because we're parochial. But if you look at the UK and the US models, I would have thought they're the benchmark. But for me, regulation, has it gone far enough is the key question. Arguably, yes. Where the regulation is important is clearly around the financial crime side of it. So regulation about customer suitability, cross-border rules, I think we'd all concur are, are really relevant. The move forward now on financial crime, again, reflecting back on the geopolitical situation and the sanctioned regime, is entirely necessary and you'd argue probably could go a little bit further. The issue you have as an asset manager and probably as a, um, an intermediary at the coalface is the effect that has on the client and lack of understanding from the client. So there's an education process for a client on the process they now need to go through to justify every source of wealth, where everything's come from, where it would have been slightly lighter touch even two or three years ago. So I would agree on everything everyone said, but I think the financial crime part has probably got legs to go a little bit further yet, to be fair. Yeah, mm. absolutely. I want to talk about management and and it, it does fascinate me within this industry, you've got teams and, and timelines. I'll, I'll go with you first, Ari. You know, you've got, you've got people in Asia, you've got people in, uh, across Latin America, which is you know, a huge range. 
Yep. Um, and you know, you've got people in the Middle East. How do you manage all of those teams and what kind of challenges does that bring managing teams in different jurisdictions? Well, a nine to five is gone, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's, that's uh, something from the past. Uh, I think the key is empowerment. Uh, you need to have your managers uh, in, in the different locations that you do business with, uh, with the power to make decisions based on, of course, the goals of, of the company. And um, there's no space for micromanagement or any of that. Uh, you have to give leeway to all these, these managers. And, um, but I think you know, technology plays a great, uh, a great, it's a great factor here. You know? I mean, and nowadays, it's so easy to communicate around the globe uh, with, with people at any time. I can push a, a button on my phone at 9 p.m. in my backyard in Miami. I can be talking uh, to my head of distribution in Asia uh, with, without a, no, a problem. No, it's, it's easy, it's fast, it's reliable. Um, so it's a little bit more of flexibility on, on everyone's end and, um, and then uh, just communicating. Good answer. I mean, it's, it's like we're always on all the time now, isn't it? Yeah. We're mobile, so we have. I mean, do, do you do you find that um, yourself? <laughs> or how do you switch off if if um, you know if I may? Because if somebody wants to get in touch with you, uh, and you know they're five hours behind, you know you like to give them a response. So you have to wait till the next day. Yeah, I mean it's challenging, isn't it? Um, but I think one has to have some discipline around it. That's key because anybody that thinks they can do. 24-7, 365 days a year is probably deluding themselves, quite frankly. And if that's what they're trying to do, I suspect there'll be a limited time span for that. But So the challenges of having an international team are many and varied. But I think Ari uh, made a great point for us. You need to start by making sure you're recruiting the right people in the first place. You need to talk to them about what are we trying to achieve. So explain the what and the why. Once you've got to that point, delegate the how to the people who typically they're highly qualified, very experienced people in their particular markets. So delegate that to them. I think you should look to check in regularly, but quite frankly, just take a step back and watch the magic happen. No, absolutely. I mean, we're dealing with, <laughs> that's a good answer. We're dealing with CEOs in the, in the room, aren't we? And, you know, largely, and, and international financial services leaders. I'll, I'll come to you, David. What, you've, you've been, a coal face CEO, and it, it's almost like, and f correct me if I'm wrong, it's almost like your role now is overseeing and looking at a, a big picture rather than that hands-on day-to-day. You used to do a lot more travel, I presume. How's, how have you kind of adapted your role, or do you still like to get in front of people? Because you can't beat face-to-face, -face, can you? Oh, I definitely like to get in front of people, and uh, I would like to travel more, but Unfortunately, COVID uh, ruined that for a while. And uh, I've been out to Dubai, uh, just to see Riyadh, of course. And, uh, but I'll go to Hong Kong as soon as they make the next step for the relaxation of the rules. I'm planning a Latin America trip in the new year and stuff. So um, I'll get out and about as soon as it's practical. Uh, and I believe Zoom and phone calls work pretty well, but I believe You've got to get out and about occasionally. I always have done, as you know. From my point, you're right, I don't have the day-to-day -day conversation, say, with the salespeople or the governance people, because we have a head of governance and we have a sales director, and that's their day-to-day -day job, and I don't and I shouldn't interfere with that. So in that sense, as we get bigger, I probably have had to let go of some of the minutiae of day-to-day, -day. Um, but they're probably very grateful for it. Uh, can I just add something, actually? So something that um, the point that David made about recruitment, the challenge, and also the, the, the issue of managing people in time zones. I, I think our businesses are facing what's probably an even bigger uh, challenge. So in addition to the cross-cultural issues, I think we've got this cross-generational conundrum sure. that's emerging at the moment. And certainly I think that is a challenge for us because we've got a generation that are in the workforce, entering the workforce, very different view of life, their expectations, different view of what a career might mean for them as well. And so if I look at my business, I think that is as big a challenge as the cultural issues of running an international business. Is, is the recruitment side of it, because you're, you know, I, I was over in Dublin recently and especially given the changes from Brexit, the, there's not enough people, there's not enough talent in Dublin now to serve the job, so recruitment's huge. It does seem to be the, you know, getting good people to, to, 
to stay with the company. I mean, Riyadh, you've, you're in an industry that naturally um, can be quite transient. You know, people come and go. How do you keep hold of good people? That's the, that's the, the, the question I'd like to ask. I think you've just got to be very, very clear at outset what you expect from those people and what those people will expect back. I think as long as you can uh, have that, that clarity and then you make an agreement and you don't move the goalposts. We both know what we're working towards, we both know what's expected, we both know what the, the rewards will be at the end. And at the same time you have to provide a platform for, for personal growth. They have to be able to feel that they can grow within the role and there is opportunity above and beyond what their remit might be at that particular time. So I just think you have to be very clear on the expectations and if you can do that and you can stick to the agreements that you've made then you know, you can move from strength to strength, as, as David was saying, you know, the company is in a position today, but in three years' time it might be a completely different opportunity. So you've just got to basically stay aligned, stay focused, and, and make sure that you, you're both meeting your end of the bargain. I suppose the environmental is the point you're making. You've got to create an environment that's conducive to people wanting to stay within your brand, and that environment is also transient in nature itself, so it's ever-changing, so it's making sure the message is communicated in the environment is open for people to progress. So probably just different words for the same, yeah. same point, but yeah. I mean, you've, you've got people around the world, David. Is, what's it like on the Isle of Man? You know, the Isle of Man, um, I come to the Isle of Man quite a lot. I like the Isle of Man. I think it's a, a wonderful place. I think you've got a good, um, a good PR team for, you know, Isle of Man PC, uh, PLC. Alaman PLC. Yeah. What's Alaman PC? That's the uh, computer company on uh, the main street, isn't it? <laughs> but what you know, do, is it something getting people to come to the Isle of Man is is that a challenge? Has it been a challenge? And how do you get around things like that with an, with island life? And I'll come to Andy with that well, question as well. It does have its attractions for people. There's mm. two types of people who seem to be very willing to come to the Isle of Man easily. One, those with young families, for whom they see this as a nice environment to bring up their families low tax, safe, etc. And those whose children have just left the nest and they're thinking, OK, we can now do five to ten years, the children are off at university or doing their own life. Uh, so those where they come over. The recruitment across the piece is difficult, but certainly doable. It's a decent population. The areas we struggle in, and I don't know if this is replicated, are in the specialised experts, so IT and project management, finance, and some of the very particular skills, say, in marketing or something. So general recruitment's OK, and there's enough in the population to, to recruit from. But we do struggle with specialist skills, artisan skills, or fin finance, governance, IT particularly. It's difficult for the government to solve that problem for us, but they do try. Anyone out there in the IT world that's looking for opportunities? The Isle Man's a, a good place to go. Uh, a hunting ground I'm, is for us is uh, Southern Africa. Uh, that's actually where recruitment is relatively straightforward. Uh, we need a bit of help with visa clearance sometimes. But actually, a lot of people from Southern Africa do want to come to the Isle of Man to work. And we're getting a lot of people from Southern Africa. I don't just mean South Africa, from Southern Africa, coming to work for us. I will ask you, um, Andy, about you know the similar the island mm. um, life situation, um, and then I'll come to Ari because uh, look, Ari, Ari's in Miami, you know, so it's. Uh, you saying that's different to Guernsey? <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what it's it, yeah, it's you. it's different yeah. and similar, isn't it? It is different. So. So I moved to Guernsey in 98 for some of the reasons that David mentioned there. I had a young family, my daughter was four, about to start at school. So often there are moments in the family's life that seem sensible to make those decisions. And my son was about 18 months at that point. So we moved to Guernsey and uh, just had a fabulous time, really enjoyed it. But I recognised that from a career perspective, some wider experience was required. I was fortunate enough to be offered an opportunity with the firm. Um, so I was working for Zurich Financial Services when I moved to Guernsey. I joined what is now Canaccord in 2002 and was offered an opportunity to go to the Isle of Man. So I've experienced both of those and both delightful places to live. They're different in, in many respects, but island life is island life. I think if you move to one of them and survive your first winter, that's a good thing because that can be a little, uh, a little challenging. Um, 
the, the, the challenge, I think, uh, it is different, certainly between Guernsey and the Isle of Man. The Isle of Man is 10 times the size of Guernsey. So from a landmass perspective, Guernsey has always tried to manage that immigration control quite carefully. And I think now we have a, a set of politicians that recognise that that needs to change. So it's much easier today for us to bring, uh, bring people in than it would have been previously. And looking outside of some of those natural places we would have gone to, we'd have looked at the UK, we'd probably for Guernsey, Jersey, looked at the south, the Isle of Man, a bit more to the north, family connections and such like, but going much further field than that and I think certainly in some of the professional services space if I look at the accountants and the lawyers certainly the sub-Saharan Africa the uh, maybe Antipodean Australia and New Zealand have become uh, territories that we look at so today we are able to do that um, I wouldn't suggest that it is for everybody but actually it's uh, there are many many attractions to island life no absolutely and I wasn't being too flippant but there's a very you know Miami and Guernsey are a very different yeah. environment, and, and both have their pluses and minuses. Yes. Yeah. But, but from so just one thing on that. So what I think is important that people often don't understand is that if you work for a business like ours, around the table, in a jurisdiction like the Isle of Man, Jersey, Guernsey, we offer people the opportunity to pursue a city-type career, but with all of the good stuff that comes with island life. And what might that be? Or the daily commute is probably the best example of that. Um, so certainly some of the challenges that we have post the pandemic in terms of what do we learn about ourselves, what are we trying to bring with us, so having some workplace flexibility is a good example of that. Actually we offer very flexible options as far as that's concerned, yet typically the number of hours that are taken are less than 5% each month. Well in Guernsey no one's more than a 10 minute drive from the office. If you're running a team in London, the different challenges with that. So I, I think that ability to have that fulfilling, meaningful career in an island uh, jurisdiction, I think, is a massive uh, driver for lots of people. I'll go to you. Thank, thanks, Andy. That's, uh, it's a good insight. And as somebody who, who travels to all of the jurisdictions that, we're, you know, that we've been talking about, it's, they all have their own pluses and minuses. One thing that came up at the International Investment um, LATAM Summit recently, uh, we were looking at a case study and I'd written a case study that was somebody moving to the, to the US um, from, from Chile, I think. It was like moving to the US and these are all the, all the, you know, what do you do with your products, what do you do with your life, your pension and all the rest of it. And that was particularly challenging. And I just want to ask you that question about recruitment from outside of the US. Is that a challenge for Investors Trust? Oh, well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, <clears throat> the US has um, a kind of a challenging immigration policy and I don't want to get into politics here in no way shape or form but of course it is difficult to get to get talent coming in and, and that's why we kind of branch out uh, 12 15 years ago and we have offices of course in Cayman Islands we have offices in Uruguay we have offices in Dubai offices in, in Kuala Lumpur and um, that actually you know help us uh, cover some positions when it's when it's possible uh, with that pool of talent in, in those countries that of course you know um, increases the scope of our search dramatically and, and we, we use it, we use it definitely uh, for, for the U.S. As a, and right now, the, uh, don't think about bringing people from the outside of the U.S. Right now, the U.S. job market is extremely, extremely uh, hot. It's very difficult to get people even in the U.S. to, to move around. Of course, Miami has a lot of interest, is, is, a, is a very nice uh, an up and coming city in the States and a lot of people want to move in, but regardless, is, is, is a tough market and it's is a difficult um, task to do that in the US too. Isn't it also fair to say the pandemics made where you sit slightly irrelevant? So if I need a position in Miami, <coughs> there's no reason why that person couldn't sit in the UK or somewhere else. There's only very few regulatory positions where the individual physically needs to sit in the country where the role is. So I think the pandemic both in communications, you both refer to Zoom and Teams communication, but also with the location independence of an individual. So I can hire somebody to cover Dubai, but they don't need to be sitting in Dubai anymore. Unless your customer interaction, your customer facing, a lot of the roles, you can be location independent. And I think the cultural, one of the upsides of COVID was the acceleration of that progress, the cultural shift to digital and location independence has become quite dramatic. And acceptance. Yeah, and the acceptance of that, yeah, I totally agree. 
It's interesting. Um, we we all have our our own takes. I remember speaking with um, I think speaking with Nigel Green from De Vere. He uh, somebody turned up to a, a Zoom meeting without a, a full suit on, <laughs> and it was like the next day the company policy was everyone had to wear a suit. Everyone had to to be dressed a certain way. It, to me, that sort of felt a little bit over the top and a little bit kind of oppressive. And, and I'll ask you this, David, and then, then move to, to Riyadh and get the, uh, the advisory world take. But what's, what's your view on people being in offices? Because surely it's about results. Well, people were achieving great results in lockdown. I think most of the companies around the table had really good periods during lockdown for, for business. As long as you're hitting the results, does it matter where you're doing the work or do you like to see those pe bums on seats in the office? Um, I believe it does matter. Uh, there's room for some flexibility, of course. If you are only doing a process task, you can probably get away with it a bit more. However, where's your team interplay? Where's your sharing of ideas? Where's the feedback back between you and your manager? Where's the bumping into people in a coffee machine that allows some sort of culture within the company to develop? So. I accept that there are some tasks that could be done remotely, and we do allow on occasion with some very special tasks, like one or two IT positions, one of the actuarial positions. But in general, I think it's counterproductive in the long term for the health of the company if everyone sits in a silo. To take an extreme, if everyone just sits behind a PC in the spare bedroom at home, and that's all anybody ever does under the brand name of a company, then I think that company will end up self-destructing. That's an extreme. Yeah, it's a fair, it's a fair point. I think there's there's, a, there's got to be a happy balance. I, I mentioned coming to you, Riyadh, because that face-to-face -face advice was always kind of sacrosanct. And then during um, the lockdown period, both the client and the advisor saw the opportunity to to do things a different way. Um, how have how has that changed your business? And then, as a sort of second question, do you um, do you need everybody in the office, especially if they're doing things on Zoom or on, on calls? Because surely people with headsets sat in a, you know, it, almost in a little tiny office themselves. Is that, is that the best way people travel in? Well, first of all, I agree with most of the, the comments that David made. It's quite hard to expand on some of those. But uh, I think there is a middle ground. For a while, I think... I mean, most of it was consumer-led. The clients wanted, you know, they were moving themselves in their own jobs, their own businesses. They were moving more towards IC solutions. So, you know, it was a rapid advancement, and it really did help for a while. So it improved efficiency, it improved the way that we uh, we interact, and we could speak with people and so on and so forth. But I, mean, I couldn't agree more. It really does, after 18 months, two years of not being able to get into the office, not being able to meet people, not being able to speak to people at all levels of the business, it can start to erode your culture. And that is critical. You have to try and maintain the culture and the morale within the operations. And like you say, we're across different jurisdictions, different times, and suddenly can, people can feel that they've no longer got a voice, they've no longer got access to somebody to, to give their opinions and to how to improve their job, their position, you know, the business. Um, so it's nice to be able to get back on a plane and go and meet with people. And it's critically important when you're having to make decisions in a fast-paced environment, which not everybody will like. They might not be perfect decisions, but you have to make a decision. If you're not able to get out there every now and again, at least explain the rationale, it becomes very difficult. So I think there is a happy medium. We'd rather have people in the office at least, you know, a few days a week. And do you know what? It's probably going to change the way that offices are set up. So you will have more communal areas, you'll have Zoom rooms, um, whatever it is to bring the people back into, into their office and start having that, that physical interaction again. I mean, just to, just to speak about Incisive Media, for example, <coughs> where we are now in this studio, this was a, a bank of desks and every, it was full. This, we were over capacity in, in this place, look, possibly looking at somewhere mm. bigger. But now with this happy medium and the flexible working, it, it's really working for, for this organisation. So I take on board what, what you were saying, Morris. Um, but, you know, you, um, this is cross-border, isn't it? So we, yeah. need to, we need to get on planes, unfortunately. Well, yeah. not fortunately. But there, is, there is a middle ground, and the bit I'd come back to is also the recruitment policy. If you're now recruiting talent, 
the younger generation has an expectation of more flexibility and the IT literate. So I don't disagree with either of the two points, but there is absolutely a hybrid model that sits in play. We've just moved into new offices in Gresham Street and they're set up exactly the way yeah. you formatted. So there's big Zoom areas, there's big modern, quite trendy um, breakout zones where people can interact. But what we don't do is expect everyone in the office five days a week. They're contracted for X days a week to be in an office, but we wouldn't expect seven hours, 35 hours a week in there. And we can see that productivity. But when you're in a competitive marketplace with looking for young talent, and it is heavily competitive for talent at the moment, to, for us to insist on a you will be tied to a desk for nine to five, five days a week, we won't recruit anybody. So <coughs> I think there is a happy medium, and I think, there, I think we'd all probably agree there's, there's a hybrid model that people are working to. So, um, one of the things that we learnt in the pandemic and in the lockdown was that our business was able to function for that, thank goodness. And you say that lots of our businesses did reasonably well, and we did, but that was based a, a lot on us not being able to spend money on stuff that we would normally have spent money on, so that kind of flattered the bottom line for that. So what did we learn? Well, we learned that gathering around the same bank of desks on a regular basis adds masses of value to a business. I think we need to differentiate between those people that have remote working contracts and those people that we offer workplace flexibility to. I think those are two different things. And I think the key challenge, and we're certainly seeing that now as an investment business, is that um, for, our, uh, for our trainees, for the people that have been in the role for uh, not so many years, for those people that are operating in a remote environment and having to engage with clients, you know, the Method 2, 10% layers are going out. To the, actually, that's really tough for them. So some of those mental health challenges that come with that, by having people together, they can listen to the experienced person talking to the clients, having that same conversation hour after hour. I think, oh, yeah, right, I've got that. I can use that. So I do think it is important to differentiate. But having people together most of the time, absolutely. I think if somebody was, I, I, can I say that? Yeah, I'm going to say that. Um, I think somebody that's choosing to work remotely completely in that way is abdicating their leadership responsibilities. I agree. You know, I think it's an, it's an important point that some people have become almost like housebound. You know, you, you, mm. everything's changed. I mean, I'm, I'm a people person. I like to get out. I like to go and travel. But some people that are naturally, you know, tendency towards that agoraphobia, they might, you know, lockdown might have been something that's maybe it's a mental health issue. You know, that's one of the reasons why senior people should get on the road. I, I've always thought so. When I go in pre-COVID times, whether it's to be UAE or Hong Kong or wherever, I didn't go just to see wonderful advisors like Riyadh, although that was always a joy. I went because I wanted to have a coffee with the regulator. I wanted yeah. to sit in front of the staff and talk to them about what we're trying to do in the business and why, or how would they fit it into that. And I'd see some advisors and so on and. So it's a whole myriad of reasons that you might go to Hong Kong or Singapore or Dubai or whatever. And uh, seeing staff is equally important. I call it plugging them back into the mothership. So we also try and bring people back to the Isle of Man. So at the moment this week, all the governance, compliance and risk people from around the world are on the Isle of Man being what I call plugged back into the mothership, reminding them of our culture, mm -hmm. who all their friends are in the different departments on the Isle of Man. We used to do it before COVID with all the salespeople as well and so on and so forth. So I think it's just absolutely crucial to people to be reminded why they work for a company and who their friends and colleagues are. No, absolutely. I think that was, a, that was a, an, an interesting debate, actually. Th thanks for that. Um, I want to whiz through some questions, if that's OK. We, one of the questions that we have was, describe the perfect leader and any examples of leaders that you admire. So I'll... If I may, I'll go around the table from uh, from left to right. So, Andy, perfect leader, who do you admire? Also? Okay, so um, look, I'm a big fan of a book called The Captain Class, written by a chap called uh, Sam Walker. And when I read it, it was quite revelatory to me because I had worked with a number of leaders who I respected greatly without necessarily being able to articulate or define all the reasons, all the reasons why. And, uh, uh, and what it talks about is that successful leaders aren't necessarily the star player in every position. They don't need to be that person. Actually, quite often they're prepared to subjugate, subjugate their ego to, to, to the greater good. Um, what they do need to do is to provide that glue. You need to bind the teams together. Uh, you need to provide that, um, I guess, is an element of um, inspiration 
and create that environment that people people deliver. So if I think about people uh, in that situation outside of my business life, I think a great example is someone like Mike Brearley. People would argue that he didn't really deserve a place in the team as a batter um, and a pretty ordinary fielder, but actually he drew that team together and made it into very successful. And when Ian Botham stepped down, he came back in and created the environment for Botham to succeed that classic Ashes series against the Australians. That's a good point. Ari? Well, last year you, you asked that question. I mentioned Greg Popovich, the head coach for the San Antonio Sports NBA. Um, I really admire him. If I can think about someone else, someone that has been doing a phenomenal job over the last 10 years, I think, is Tim Cook, CEO of Apple. Got a really hot potato uh, with, with a change, significant change in the, in the, in the company and really took it to the ne next level, uh, to places where many of us, I guess, me for sure, didn't expect it to go. So I, I think kudos for that job, amazing. Good, good, uh, good choice. It's quite, uh, th there's two quite, um, quite interesting uh, characters. Morris? I'm not gonna give you a standard answer because I think you have different leaders for different situations and I think you could take um, behaviors from different leaders that build a person, so I mean, I think you are great leaders, I think both of those two are great examples, but there'll be parts where they're slightly weaker. So I think what you got, if you're looking for a, a perfect example, you're building skills from different individuals. I love that I'm not sure there is a perfect leader. I don't think there's an individual that would stand out. I think people have got different skills. Yeah, there's always you, I, I, I agree. Um, and then it's clearly Riyadh as well. But ultimately, I think people have different strengths from different situations. And I think if you're going to choose someone, I think you're choosing situationally. And both those examples are people who have come to the fore in a situation, so their situation skills. If the situation was different, would they, and it's an open question, would they still be the best leader and still be the example? I don't know. So I think it's a very difficult question to answer, to be fair. Riyad, I think hot potato offer on your way. Anyone probably, that you admire, any, any leaders in media? Well, I think it'd be better, to, I can build on what Morris has just said there, because you know different leaders, different positions, and so on and so forth. But one thing I have noticed is when you look at these leaders that are really at the, the top of their game, they can pretty much be summarized really by one or two traits. I mean, you, you know, they're repeatedly summarized by people when you say, okay, the, the Queen's steadfast, resolute. You look at Elon Musk, you know, driven, relentless pursuit of his goals. You can look at Alex Ferguson, grit and determination. They almost personify those words. They embody them. They can't be misrepresented or misunderstood. So it gives clarity of the message to people. So, you know, you work up, you turn up to Tesla at the factory, you're probably going to be sleeping on the floor. Mm -hmm. You know that before you go in. So they're almost unapologetic about it. And they're the kind of people that, that I would really admire. And I think on a human level, I think people would rather deal with people that are people that are real rather than people that are necessarily right. And so I think anybody who is you know, clear about themselves, their ambition, they understand what they want to try and achieve and they can convey that, I think they're the kind of people that, that I would say I would admire. David? I agree with everything that's uh, been said. There's no such thing as one type of leader. It all depends on circumstances and different organisations. But I'll give a couple of examples of people I've actually worked for who really inspired me. One when very junior part of my career was Rupert Murdoch, who I think is very misunderstood who is a fantastic leader of a business. Uh, the other more home to this industry is somebody who anybody who worked for Swiss Life will remember is Chris Eide, who is an amazingly kind, insightful and gentle soul, slightly shy, but in his own way, a fantastic chief executive. That anybody who ever worked for him who's listening to this will remember as being just a great guy. And the one person I haven't met, sadly, who I'd love to know more about as a leader and probably one of my all-time heroes is Admiral Jackie Fisher. Uh, from the Royal Navy, uh, late 19th century. If you're interested, go and Google him or read Fisher's Face by Jan Morris. Fantastic. I mean, some, for me, that's kind of the, the, the fun bit of the day. Uh, we're, we're coming to, a, to the end of um, this particular leadership debate summit. Just as a final, and I did this, I, I've done this before, and I've said, um, if, we, if we look at three three word answers from the table uh, it's just three words what you need to be a successful leader in our industry three words now I think it's un it's unfair to go around the table so let's just do it sporadically we'll go to you Morris first three words off the top of your head um, vision direction and communication 
David? I think purpose, uh, commitment, adaptability. Ari, by the way, you can use the same, same word if you, if you <laughs> that want will to. Be, that would be cheating, right? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> you have to be flexible. And I'm not going to use just the word. I'm going to say you need to be able to create a community. Flexible community. And a third? Oh, a third. Um, joy. Joy. That's, it's, I like that, actually. Riyadh, coming straight to you. Vision, communication, and passion. That's great. Now, you've had the longest to think from everybody, and they may have all picked yours. Three, three simple words. Yeah, so I think three Ps, drawing on what the others... I think purpose, I think principles, passion would be my final one. Enthusiasm, the ability to take people with you. Fantastic. And I like, I like doing that because it's, it's, it's a bit of fun more than anything, but it's, uh, it's interesting to see which one's come up. Thank you, everybody, for, for attending this. Thanks once again for, for supporting um, this debate. I think it's an important one to have. It's great that everybody gets together. Um, thanks for joining us today with this um, International Investment Leadership Summit. Thanks for tuning in and uh, goodbye. Mm -hmm.